And so uh, welcome everyone to the August 2021 meeting for the Astronomy Fundamentals Group. Um, got kind of a small crowd here tonight on the meeting. Um, tonight, uh, we uh, have two present, we have our typical format of having a constellation of the month and a main topic presentation. Uh, Doug Smith will be doing the constellation Fornax uh, to start us off with, and I will be following it up with the main topic presentation on kind of giving on the NGT catalog and talking about some of the, the, the history and overview of um, such an important uh, deep sky object catalog for both amateurs and professionals. And uh, with that, Doug, we'll kick it back to you. Okay. So I'm doing the constellation Fornax. Uh, we're getting into the real southern constellations and trying to finish up our list. We don't have that many more to go, I don't think, um, before we start recycling. Um, as always, I put in a comical slide. And this one showed up when I was searching for it. comedy. I like that. What the neighbors think I see, what my family thinks I see, and what I really see. Okay. All right, so Fornax is located in the Southern Hemisphere. It's a Southern constellation. Um, it's an average size constellation. It ranks 41 in terms of size out of the 88 constellations. So it's right in the middle. Covers about 15 degrees in declination and about two hours of right ascension. It's pretty rectangular shape, like you can see in the picture there. Um, it's wrapped on one side by Eridanus um, and then borders Cetus, Sculptor, and Phoenix on the other side. It is visible from Tucson because um, it only goes down to minus 40 degrees and we can technically see down to minus 58. Um, and the best time to see it, if you want to see it, would be November and December. Um, it was um, described at first by Nicholas I'm going to butcher the name, Louis de la Cal. I'm sure that's not right. He described it uh, as a Fernier chimique, the chemical furnace. Um, most of the Southern Hemisphere, or, or not most, but there's a lot of um, constellations in the Southern sky that were named after instruments like sextants and um, other things like that, scientific instruments. And instead of after, obviously, no Greek mythology in the Southern Hemisphere, but uh, the people who went down there and looked at these constellations just decided to name them off for instruments that were used at that time. Um, and so this was named the chemical furnace. Um, you can see it down there in the bottom left there in the square, the red square, there's the furnace. And it's actually kind of a still kind of a thing, which was a scientific instrument that was used back then. Um, it was first put on a planisphere uh, in 1752. Um, he was down there at the Cape of Good Hope, putting together a catalog of Southern stars. Um, and he developed, like I said, he had 14 new constellations, uh, and all of them except for one were named after instruments. So this thing is a, a still, if you like, a furnace, a still kind of thing. Um, it's a pretty easy constellation to miss because it's not very bright. There are no stars brighter than magnitude three. Um, but if you look at it with binoculars, it's actually pretty rich in stars. It has uh, five stars brighter than magnitude five, but over 60 stars that are greater than magnitude seven. Um, 
which is a little bit surprising that it's that rich in stars because you're looking 90 degrees away from the galactic plane. And, and you're looking straight up out of the galactic plane and you wouldn't expect to see a lot of stars, but there are a lot of sort of dim stars that are there. Um, there's a lot of interesting stars in the constellation and I couldn't do them all. I picked what I thought were the most interesting stars to talk about. So I'll, I'll talk about uh, the most interesting stars, if you like. So um, surprisingly enough, Alpha Fornix is a pretty interesting star. Um, it's the brightest star, obviously, at Alpha. It's magnitude 3.85. And what makes this star so interesting is it has a very high proper motion. It's three quarters of an arc second per year, which is really fast in terms of proper motion. It is moving really fast. Um, it is a binary star. Um, the primary component is an orange subgiant spectral type F8. Um, it is very close to us. It's at 45.6 light years away from us. It's estimated to be about 3 billion years old. And they think that it just moved off the main sequence recently, whatever that means. Um, the star is about twice the size of the sun and it has about five times the luminosity. The secondary star is what they call a blue straggler. It's a blue dwarf star uh, that has a high metal content. Um, Beta Fornax is a really interesting star too. It's a, a yellow giant star, spectral class G8. It's got a magnitude of 4.5. It has cooled and it's swelled. It's 11 times the sun's diameter. It's at a distance of 178 light years. It is what's called a red clump giant, which I had never heard of before. And what that means is it has, under, it has gone through a, the helium flash and is currently fusing helium in its core. So that's an interesting star. Um, another interesting star is Epsilon Fornix, um, which is also circled on the chart there. Uh, it's just shy of magnitude six, it's a 5.89. It's a binary star, 104 light years away. Um, it has component stars that orbit each other every 37 years. The primary star is very old, 12 billion years old, and has cooled and expanded to more than twice the size of the sun. Um, and it's only got 91% of the mass of the sun. So it's an old star, 12 billion years. Kappa, up in the upper right corner there, um, is a triple star system composed of a yellow giant and a pair of red dwarfs. Um, the primary star is a G1. It's a little bit, sorry, that's supposed to be massive, not massive. It's 20% more massive than the sun, a little bit hotter, 100 degrees Kelvin hotter. And the two secondary stars are both M-class dwarfs with a mass of about half the sun, and it's 72 light years distance. Our Fornax, which is in the other circle, but not shown on the chart, um, but it would be right in the middle of that second circle, is a carbon star. Um, it's on the giant branch with a lot of carbon in its atmosphere. Um, it's a Myra variable with a period of 389 days and varies between magnitude 7.5 and 13. It's around 1800 light years distant. And new Fornax is a really interesting star. Um, it's a variable star, it's blue white, and it is visible to the naked eye with a apparent magnitude of around 4.7. It's 370 light years from the sun and it's moving away from the sun. It's got a radial velocity of 18 kilometers per second. It is a candidate member of something called the Pisces Eridinus stellar stream, which is a stream of stars that 
are probably left over from some kind of a collision with another uh, really small galaxy or, or a dwarf galaxy. And there's a screen that's getting pulled out of the Milky Way. Um, and they think that this star uh, was a member of that stream. And based on that, they, can, they think that the age is around 120 million years. Um, the object is an 8P star with a, um, with a stellar classification of B953 SPSI, whatever. So it's a B-type giant star. And the SI means it has a huge amount or abundant anomaly, if you like, of silicon. Um, it is a variable star of what's called alpha chem thanatocorum type of variable. I don't exactly, I've never looked at one of those. Um, it, change, it ranges in magnitude from 4.68 down to 4.73 with a really short period of 1.89 days, which happens to match its rotational period, which is interesting. Um, it's a little over three and a half times as massive as the sun and about 250 times as luminous. And it has about three and a half times the sun size. Okay, so those were the, what I thought were the more interesting stars. Uh, there probably are others, but that's all I could dig up. Now, in terms of deep sky objects, because you're looking straight up out of the galactic plane, and you're not looking through very much of the Milky Way, Fornax turns out to be really rich in deep sky objects, most of which are other galaxies not connected with the Milky Way. And some of them are very important for today's research. Um, so I'll go through some of the deep sky objects. The list was really long and I picked out again what I thought were the most interesting ones or the prettiest ones. So like this one, NGC 1097 is the only one that's actually marked on this chart. Um, it's a nice barred spiral galaxy at magnitude 10.2, and it's located around 45 million light years away. That's a nice Hubble picture of it. Um, one of the Milky Way's satellite galaxies is located in Fornax. The Fornax dwarf spheroidal is, it's an elliptical dwarf galaxy and it is one of the satellite galaxies in the Milky Way. Um, it was discovered by Harlow Shapley back in the thirties while he was in South Africa. Um, and it was discovered by taking a picture. Um, the galaxy contains six globular clusters and one of the global clusters was actually discovered before the galaxy itself because the, the global cluster is actually pretty bright. Uh, the galaxy itself is very difficult to see. <laughs> the stars are not very bright and it's um, hard to see with an amateur telescope, almost impossible. Um, and the galaxy was, is receding from the Milky Way at 53 kilometers per second and is made up mostly of what's called population two stars. So it's old. And it's located in the middle of that red circle. This is the bright globular cluster that's in that galaxy, NGC 1049, really bright globular cluster. It is visible in moderate sized telescopes, it's got a magnitude of 12.9. So uh, you, you can see it with a reasonable telescope. And this globular cluster was discovered almost 100 years before the galaxy was discovered. And then there's a nice planetary nebula in Fornax. It's called the Robin's Egg Nebula because it looks like it's got the same color as a robin's egg. Um, and uh, NGC 1360. Um, <clears throat> the central star of this planetary has been confirmed that it's actually a binary star, which is unusual for a planetary nebula to have a binary star as the central star. Um, 
and it's at magnitude 9.4, so it's fairly easy to see in a modest telescope. And by the way, I didn't write it down here, but when I was finishing up my slides, uh, I found out that this, this nebula here is actually about four times the size of the ring nebula. So this is a fairly large planetary nebula. Um, I might go looking for it next time, next year, because I haven't seen it. And it's not that far south. It's at minus, about minus 25. So we look at things that far south all the time. Mm -hmm. um, this galaxy, NGC 1365, has been called the Great Barred Spiral Galaxy. Um, it's at 56 million light years, and it's, it's um, if you, the reason it's called the Great Barred Spiral Galaxy is take a look at that picture. Look at that bar in the middle, that big, thick yellow bar going from left to right. That's a really thick bar for a barred spiral galaxy. Um, and that's where it got its name. Um, so they know that this thing has a supermassive black hole at the center, and it's about 10th magnitude, and it's in what's called the Fornax cluster of galaxies. There's a cluster of galaxies in Fornax, like the Virgo cluster, which I'll get to. And it's located down here in that corner down there. Um, and then you've got this guy, NGC 1316. Um, this guy is also known as Fornax A. It's about 60 million light years. Um, and this is a bright radio galaxy. Um, this thing is at, at 1400 megahertz. This is the fourth brightest radio source in the sky. Um, it's very similar to Centaurus A. Kind of looks like it too. It's down there in that red circle. And uh, now you've got what's called the Fornax cluster. This is a cluster of galaxies um, lying at a distance of about 19 megaparsecs or 62 million light years. Um, the total mass of this cluster is about seven, give or take, times 10 to the 13th solar masses, making it the second richest galaxy cluster within 100 million light years after the Virgo cluster being the largest. Um, it may be associated with another group called the Aridanus group. Not sure of that. It's mostly in the constellation of Fornax and a little bit overlaps into Aridanus. Um, and it covers an area of the sky about 66 degrees in diameter. Um, it's a valuable source of information about the evolution of clusters because it's relatively close. It's a lot closer than the Virgo cluster. And it shows the gravitational effects of merger of galaxies and galaxy subgroups. Um, so it's, it's used a lot for studying uh, the effects of galaxies, how they interact with each other. Um, at the center is 1399, which is a big elliptical galaxy. And then there's other galaxies in there that are listed. And actually there's a long list, longer than this list. And 1316 is the brightest, which I think I had a picture of earlier. And so this is a nice cluster of galaxies. And there's what it looks like. So that's a neat cluster in uh, galaxies in, in the uh, constellation Flax. Yeah, that barred spiral down at the bottom. It's one of the ones I showed you. Um, and then another thing that's in Fornax is the ultra deep field image that Hubble took. It was an image that was taken in the constellation Fornax um, using new cameras and stuff uh, to, to go farther and deeper than the original deep field did. And it was taken back in 2003. And it was used to search for galaxies very older and older and older, if you like. And they picked that area because there aren't any bright stars. Yeah, if you look at the chart, you can see the little red square. That's where the Hubble deep field was taken. I'm oh, sorry, the ultra deep field. And there's no stars in that area. So they picked an area that was pretty much empty. And that's the picture they got. 
of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Oh. And that is my last slide. Any questions on Fornax? That's it. Thank you, Doug. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. And uh, moving, moving on to the main topic for the night, which Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Cool. Yes. So as I kind of mentioned uh, in the intro for this, so the NGC catalog is uh, one of the most commonly used catalogs by uh, amateur astronomers today. Uh, it and the Messier catalog uh, basically form the backbone of just about any observing list uh, for those interested in deep sky objects. Uh, so know, knowing about it, uh, sorry. So this gets a lot of importance in knowing kind of what's what's on it, what it's what it's about, and a little bit about what the history is. Uh, so the NT catalog stands for New General Catalog. Uh, it's, it is one of many deep sky objects, deep, deep, deep sky object catalogs from Messier, Caldwell, Shapeless, Sharpless. Uh, I see there's just so many catalogs right now uh, for various things and uh, as being, we get more and more out there. A lot of them are really becoming more dedicated to photogra photographic objects, um, putting them flat out of the reach for the visual observers. Uh, but some of the older catalogs such as Messier, NGC and a couple of others uh, do contain a lot of really good uh, visual objects. Uh, so, uh, you know, making a, a good source for just finding things you want to look at on any particular night you want to go out and observe. Uh, other catalogs often are built from elements within the NGC catalog, uh, such as the Caldwell list. Uh, but uh, the Caldwell contains a mix of mostly photographic objects and some really cool visual objects, which uh, we may see later on. Uh, there are, a, we've got zoom overlays all over the place for me, give me a second. There are a sizable number of items uh, that are both open to us, both visually and photographically. Uh, it's kind of a mixed bag though, because the object list is so big. Um, there's a lot of things that are too small to see with our equipment, uh, or at least within reasonable equipment that you might have stashed around. Uh, when I talk reasonable, I typically say anything between uh, a 10 inch or lower telescope, just because things higher than that are a little bit pricey. I like to keep the, my telescopes in the realm of a, you know, not breaking the bank when we go by them. Many of the objects that we look at in the night sky tonight, uh, or that you might see um, on other websites are, are, are pulled from the NGC catalog. Uh, and it, the, the catalog is so often used that if you see, uh, as you may have also seen in uh, the picture Doug had earlier of the star charts for Fornax, you'll notice that there were uh, just numbers in a couple of spots on that. Uh, those were NGC objects, and we just get, we've gotten to the point where we just leave off the NGC prefix when, when on uh, many modern star charts because we just assume it's from the NGC catalog. Come on, next slide. Uh, kind of giving another idea here of what we mean. So the six 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 three four seven five one four seven one eight five. These are all all four of these items are NGC catalog numbers versus M one zero three and M fifty two, which are clearly Messier catalog. So you know, quick and easy to find on star charts. Um, so. Obviously, uh, with new in the name of the catalog, there must have been something that have come before it. And in, indeed, uh, the NGC's uh, predecessor catalog, known as the general catalog, was assembled by uh, the Herschel siblings, or more, um, the Herschel family, over, you know, a course of, you know, over 100 years uh, with Will and Carolyn Herschel, 
Carolyn Herschel, who are brother and sister, uh, publishing the first draft of the NUC catalog in the 1780s. Uh, a short time after uh, Messier published his catalog, um, which you know, considering that, you know, there's about a thousand more entries in the general catalog compared to Messier's comparatively small list, it's, it's kind of a funny just how quickly things grow in the night sky uh, as you know, new people start looking up. Uh, and the first, as uh, the general kind of objects uh, contained about a thousand objects, all of which were individually plotted uh, and observed by both Will and Carolyn. Uh, both, um, they published a series of revisions to the catalog, uh, correcting small things such as uh, stellar coordinates uh, over the next, uh, cataloging new entries that the, the pair found over the next 30 years uh, until eventually uh, William's son, John, uh, was adding, who became a very uh, important astronomer and physicist in his own right, much like his father, uh, added about another 2,500 objects. So just between the hurdles, about 5,000 objects in the night sky were cataloged uh, by this family. Uh, so uh, hoping to do a couple of presentations coming up uh, about their contributions, because there's a lot of stuff that, that these three have done uh, for the astronomy field. Uh, the last uh, Herschel edition of the catalog was published in 1864, uh, um, about 80 years after the original published date. So it goes to show just how, how over how long this catalog was built. At the time it was completed by the Herschels, it contained about 5,000 objects. Uh, quick portraits of the Herschels uh, going from William, Caroline, and, and John. Uh, Hopefully, I'll, I'll have some presentations to talk more about them in, in coming meetings. Uh, so moving on from them, we then have to segue over to uh, John Luis Emil Dreyer. Excuse me, Dreyer. He uh, is a Danish astronomer uh, and uh, worked in a couple of other observatories until uh, he eventually worked his way over to the R. Armaga Observatory in Northern Ireland, where he proceeded to work at the observatory from 1882 until his retirement in 1916. Uh, he published, uh, the, he was one of the, he was the first person to publish a supplement to the general catalog before the Royal Astronomical, Astronomical Society basically said, stop doing that, just go make this bigger catalog on your own. And so he did. Uh, he spent about two years compared to the you know 30 plus years that the, well that the uh, Herschel system did took to build the general catalog and uh, basically used a whole bunch of references and other existing catalogs to assemble what has became the first draft of the NGC catalog, which he published in uh, 1888 and, and I think it was the letters and the letters for the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, this is uh, an aerial overview image of the Armag Armaga Observatory as it stands today. It has a notable distinction of also having the longest continuously run weather observatory in the world with observations dating back, uh, I think, uh, to the 1700s, the early 1700s. Uh, so uh, still an active place today uh, for research, although maybe not necessarily what uh, it was originally created for. Uh, part of the impetus for creating this new catalog uh, is you know, you know, there. By this point, there were so many people floating around their own private catalogs with things um, not on them, things not on them. Uh, as, as we eventually found, objects that were just never there in the first place because they, they may have been uh, artif defect artifacts and uh, telescopes for specific equipment used by the astronomers of their day. Uh, but uh, the goal uh, that Dreyer kind of set out for himself was he wanted to make the catalog that contained uh, nearly every known deep sky object in the sky at the time. And um, and that part, he was successful all for about five years when eventually, you know, new objects were found. Um, we obviously, you know, given the, uh, the number of things today, uh, it we still have the same problem of just being able to find things in the night sky that are interesting to look at. Uh, 
And computers have helped quite a lot here, just being able to Google is like, what are some things I'm going to go look at in the night sky? Uh, but the the need to be able to, to find uh, useful and interesting things continues to be a problem for us today, uh, both for amateurs and professionals, because there are just so many things. Uh, the final result uh, of Dreyer's work uh, pulled from about 50 other catalogs, collections, and papers that were published by various astronomers. Uh, he, for some reason, decided to organize his objects by right ascension. Uh, and the catalog that he originally published spanned over 250 pages, front to back. And as I mentioned a second ago, it contained every object in the night sky that was known at the time, totaling about 7,840 objects. Um, and uh, since Dreyer assembled this over a two-year time span, he didn't have time to go and look at all objects in his catalog. He kind of just had to take things on face value from the materials he was looking at which led to the original catalog containing items that didn't exist or were uh, due to typographical errors in the papers and materials he was pulling from uh, contained misplaced locations, uh, right ascension and declination coordinates. Most often the error would be that they flipped the sign on the RA on the declination value so that instead of being in the Northern hemisphere, the object was in the Southern hemisphere and vice versa. Um, um, sometimes they're also brought about by his own error. Uh, for example, uh, NGC 2163 was cataloged as non-existent because uh, by Dreyer, when it was cataloged by the Herschels because he made an error in his when he was copying the data over from the source materials. Um, this is kind of a snippet of uh, Dreyer's original publication which was again published in the 1980s. So we do have some modern typographical fonts to deal with conveniently instead of um, handwriting in uh, cursive uh, and other, um, excuse me, instead of uh, personal handwriting, which would most have been common by uh, the Herschels. Uh, the, on the right hand side here, there's a summary description. Uh, these are actually encodings to represent the specific types of objects. And I forgot to actually include a slide explaining what the encodings are. Uh, but this was basically uh, an astronomer shorthand for being able to code like, hey, this is a planetary nebula or this is a, a galaxy and so on. Um, just because, you know, writing out galaxy in such a small space is, um, you know, very difficult. Uh, after Dreyer published his, there were a couple of other extensions that have been added to the NGC over time. Uh, as shown in Doug's presentation earlier, there are um, a couple of newer objects that have been added to it over time, such as the, uh, the dwarf galaxy in Fornax that he, he mentioned. Uh, that's actually a, a, child gal a, a dwarf galaxy of the Milky Way itself. Uh, so there, there continued to be extension. There continued to be extensions to the NGC catalog well after Dreyer's publication. Um, but even as he, after he, while Dreyer was alive, he continued to publish um, some new catalogs as well, also creating what's known as the IC catalog, um, which contains almost exclusively photographic photographic only objects. Uh, because uh, coming in here at the end of the 1880s, as he did. Uh, with the event, people finally deciding to take cameras and point them at the night sky with their telescopes uh, uh, started to actually catch on both for, for professionals, which led to him creating a second catalog with all these new objects that people were photographing of. Uh, more recently, um, there have been some more modern revisions to the NGC catalogs, uh, starting with the NGC 2000 project, uh, which set about correcting some of the errors in Dreyer's original work. Um, adding some of their own errors to at the time. Um, then uh, the more recent NGC IC project, which uh, went over through deep sky survey data provided by Palomar Observatory of all places, and uh, uh, gave accurate observations for every object in the NGC and IC catalog uh, in confirmations and uh, positional data that we get from having a lot more modern telescope systems. Uh, and I, so the, the kind of confusion that comes to me is, um, you know, you have all these different versions of the NGC catalog. So it's sometimes kind of a, a question of which revision am I looking at? And I think uh, if you're having a go-to telescope, 
uh, it's either using a combination of the NGC 2000 data or the NGC IC project, uh, depending on you know what year your telescope was manufactured in. Um, oh, that was a placeholder slide. I forgot to fill out. My apologies. Uh, so Dreyer was also notable for a couple of other contributions he made. He was uh, an avid historian of astronomy as well, uh, assembling one of uh, his own uh, auto, not autobiography, excuse me, a biography of uh, Tycho Brahe, and uh, also organized and published many of uh, Tycho Brahe, Tycho's uh, private correspondences uh, in a, a humongous 15 volume collection. With that. That's just a lot of work for one person to do. Uh, so you know, passing on some of the, the uh, observations of Tycho on to us today. Um, he also created uh, essentially one of the more recent histories of astronomy, uh, which has now printed as a history of astronomy from Thales to Kepler. And I think it's printed out of the Cambridge University Press. Um, and he also co-edited the official history of the Royal Astronomical Society. Society. So uh, some really cool works for those who like to know more about, you know, the history of the astronomy hobby as a whole. You'll, you'll, you may very well find works written by uh, John Dreyer. Uh, circling back, uh, you know, with the objects in the NGC, the, excuse me, the NGC catalog containing as many objects as it does, contains basically every type of D-sky object you could want. There's globular clusters, open clusters, and, and, uh, emission and reflection nebula, planetaries, asterisms all over the place. So uh, you're, there's definitely something in the, in the catalogs that satisfy just about any type of um, observational preference that you might have, uh, whether you find yourself as a deep sky object person or a, a, you know, a, a multi-star systems. There's something in there for the, in the NGC catalog for you. It's just sometimes a matter of finding it. Uh, this is uh, another slide ship pulled from the uh, original publication of the NGC catalog, uh, showing just a list of the sources that Dreyer had pulled from in order to, to make the catalog. Some names that we might recognize, like Herschel, um, and some more other recent ones that we may um, may make interesting conversations on, on topic of conversations in a teacher meetings on their own. We'll, we'll have to see. But that was one of the things that uh, set uh, his catalog out for apart from others is that he actually cited all the sources that he pulled them from rather than just like, hey, here's this collection of things. So um, we've, we've actually gone back to those original publications to help cross verify some of these, these objects over time. Um, being assembled, um, starting as some, being assembled at the, during the time period it was, uh, telescopes ranging um, from two inches all the way up to a mammoth 72 inches were used um, for, for catalog, the original NGC catalog. So the, definitely stuff in there that starts to push outside of the range of what amateurs would be useful towards uh, what, be, what would be accessible to amateur astronomers today. Uh, I think I, the dimmest object I've seen in the NGC catalog goes all the way up to magnitude 8 cane. And the average uh, limiting magnitude for an eight inch Smith Cassegrain grain is about magnitude 14. So definitely, definitely one of those things to watch out for is, you know, making sure you're, you're getting objects that you can actually um, see. Some of them also in the catalog tend to be very dim or small in angular diameter. So you might end up picking things that are like three arc minutes or smaller, which is you know, something. So, you know, just some small mind traps to watch out for. Um, but many of the original items uh, cataloged by Carolyn William and John Herschel are all generally accessible to amateurs today, just because of the equipment that they were working with. But, um, and uh, as, as with that last item, as I mentioned earlier, uh, your go-to is like is likely pulling from the NGC 2000 catalog. Um, and uh, this is just a short list of NGC objects that I've observed in my own time or photographed. All of them are uh, pretty, pretty good. Some of them can be quite large, like the Rosette Nebula, which spans almost one square degree or about 
two full moons. Uh, but most of them are uh, quite good in an 8 inch Smith Cassegrain uh, or similar comparable telescope. Um, you, there's also um, an interesting link um, down here that pulls up a list of about 110 um, other notable NGC objects that we, you might find interesting. Um, you can also just Google it real, real quick, uh, but definitely something to look at. Uh, I, the objects in here are all named objects. Um, that's by far not the norm in the NGC catalog where many of them just have a number. Um, so named objects are, are if, if an object does have a name, it's usually one that's generally worth looking at. Uh, and that's it for me. Any questions? Um, yeah, Connor, what happened? Where does the, um, the RNGC catalog fit in? Do you know? The, that's, I, I, I saw that it's, it's an extension of, um, we have a copy of it in the library and I have a personal copy myself. It's, it's like the revised NGC. It, well, it's another exactly one of what it stands for, but where does it fit in the history? Is it something? It was done before 1975, I think was when it was published. It, it was done before um, the, uh, my before brain, the my brain. yeah, it was done before the NGC 2000 project. I didn't include it just because the, um, obviously a time and the NGC Not 2000 was more are. recent and it's, yeah. it, it's one of those historical artifacts rather than um, okay. versus the, the last two NGC 2000 and IC projects were ones that I think are, are what most modern NGC catalogs are based off of today. Okay. But I, it does come, it was assembled, uh, I think 73 is when it started or when it was completed, one of those two. Yeah, because I, I got it. It's 75 is the copyright date on it. Yeah, that sounds about right. But um, yeah. So it was some kind of in between, you might say. I, I, it was, the, I think, the first attempt to try to clarify a lot of the errors and see what things in it are. Because as, as I bench, as mentioned, there's a lot of errors in the original yeah. NGC catalog you know, of it, things that didn't exist. I think it was something, an intermediate step. Um, because it also contains the index catalog objects. So I think it was some kind of an intermediate step here. But obviously it's not used anymore. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's some research paper out there that has <laughs> that continues to use it just because why not? Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe. But uh, excellent question. Um, anyone else? Yeah, who, um, who, who is anybody adding anything to these? Uh, w w what would make another project? Uh, who, who would be responsible for that? Um, so most catalog, like, uh, catalogs have been made by just about anybody. Uh, like for example, the Caldwell catalog, which I kind of mentioned early in the presentation is actually a, one of the more recent catalogs that was created by an amateur astronomer um, it was published in like the mid nineties. Uh, so there's no real formal governing body uh, around catalogs. Um, most of them typically come to us from, you know, uh, large uh, telescope surveys of the night sky, like you might get with um, the Sloan Deep Sky Survey um, and that sort of thing. So they typically might get cataloged with whatever digital, with, with whatever telescope or sky survey generated the data and cataloged that entry. Um, but uh, other than that, you could certainly go out and make your own, which is what um, Caldwell did with his when he published his in Sky and Telescope in the mid nineties. Um, so most of the new objects that are discovered nowadays are discovered using, like uh, Connor said, professional observatories are discovering new objects all the time and Hubble objects, Hubble discovered lots of objects. They usually have very complex names because the names are usually a series of letters and a series of numbers that translate to a particular survey that was done with a particular instrument at a particular time. And they're just numbers. I, I was looking at the constellation Fornax and there were some oddball objects in there that had things like GCF1A.632.3222, those kinds of things. 
and they're meaningful in the sense that you can look them up and find them online and their survey they're they're done through a survey from a professional observatory and that's that's their way of maintaining their list of new objects and um no one's putting together any new catalogs that I know of. So are things with a name starting with an H discovered by Hubble? No, not it, necessarily. Not necessarily. That, <laughs> it, it, it's one of those things that causes a lot of confusion to amateurs. Uh, you, just you because have to, you have to look up what the catalog actually is. You have to track it down. <laughs> yeah, which could be a little bit of a legwork, but usually fairly quick now when you can just Google you know, here's my catalog number. And then usually Wikipedia will point you in a good direction um, fairly quickly. Or, uh, you know, you might, if you're unlucky enough, they'll point you just to a research paper. And then you have to read through that, which doesn't happen very often, but can. I, I don't know if anyone will ever put together any new catalog like the NGC, because um, the catalogs that are currently existed like Caldwell and the Messier and the, and, the, and the NGC are predominantly used by amateurs now and uh, I can't imagine an amateur astronomer putting together another catalog that goes beyond the NGC. Yeah I was kind of specifically thinking about you know all the discoveries from Hubble you know it, do, do they have their own they have a they have an official designation that's approved by the IAU, the you know the International Astronomical Union has to approve all names. Um, that's, that's, but forgot about that, that's right. There, it's it's just some designation that they use for, you know, Hubble or for Sloan or for you know they have those designations. Like I said that are very complex, but they have a meaning, and they're unique. So. And you'll and you no, know, it's very rare that you'll have an object in the sky that has only one catalog designation. That's true. Like, like the Andromeda Galaxy has like thirty-five. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Um, but the new, you know, the new objects that are be discovered by Hubble and things like that might only be visible in Hubble, so they might only have that Hubble designation. So. Uh, with that, uh, well, uh, something that's uh, un totally unrelated to the subject is that um, maybe it'll be clear enough tonight to see some meteors. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep your fingers crossed, Kay, but I'm not. <laughs> My weather app currently says uh, cloud, 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 all the way up until uh, I can't see past it anymore till tomorrow or tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Oh, we're just cursed in being able to see the Perseids. Every year, it's the same thing. It's always monsoon season during Perseid meteor shower. Looks well, clearer at my house. Here in the middle of where monsoon comes in the summer, as you miss the summer stuff. Well, it was pretty clear outside the last time I looked. So maybe. That's yeah, definitely the clearer. exception rather than the norm, though. <laughs> I'm, I'm in looking north at Tucson. A lot of clouds right now. So that's all I had. Um, I was hoping for a little bit more people uh, on tonight because I wanted to also discuss, you know, some ideas about what we might want to do after we finish all the constellations. Um, Let's go ahead and discuss it, even though you don't have a huge crowd. There's no reason we can't yeah. talk about it. You know, it's kind of one of those things that we we had kind of be started floating some ideas around last semester. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording here. Okay. For this. Okay.